You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 98, a deep dive with Dr. Dan German of OrthoBrain. In this second interview with Dr. German, we branch out in our conversation to some more controversial topics. We ask him about airway-centric orthodontics. Are orthodontists causing harm by taking teeth out? Is orthodontic surgery underutilized or is it just a reimbursement problem? Is there a difference in ortho brackets or is it all just marketing? We cut through the fluff to bring you something you can use in your practice tomorrow, this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by The Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, The Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call one 800 472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Des Moines, Iowa this fall 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series. Welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, you know, I want to get right into the meat of this, but before we do, uh, join back with Dr. Dan Gurman. Coming up in the next couple of episodes, I think you're going to really love what we're going to be talk about. talking about. We really hit it off, as you know, with Jack and Conrad from Absolute Dental Services talking about some, some stuff uh, concerning full arch prosthetics. If you haven't heard that episode, go back and check that out, the uh, Pioneers in Zirconia. Um, but they're going to be coming on for episode uh, coming up here real soon in the coming weeks. And we're going to be talking about um, pitfalls and things to look for, complications surrounding full arch prosthetics when it comes to dental implants. Yeah. And I'm what super to watch excited out about for it. in your yeah. full arch from a lab who's truly seen it all over the years, how to avoid the most common mistakes, what steps are most important. So for mm-hmm. you who've been doing this a long time, <clears throat> you're going to pick up on some little things that maybe will make things easier. For those of you who are just maybe getting interested in full arch or maybe intimidated by full arch implant dentistry, this is a great place, I think, to start because you're going to hear mm-hmm. uh, from from a lab who sees everything and has developed systems, systems for their doctors to follow. They've even got uh, manuals for yeah, their doctors. really good to stuff. Find. In fact, so, I think they're the only one that has a, a manual for the CONUS system. You know, they developed it themselves. So you're not going to want to miss that coming up soon. And, and man, we're almost... We're almost to the big 100, Wes. Big 100 coming up. Man, what <clears throat> are we going to be talking about on episode 100? John and I are scheming <laughs> That's and right. working behind Got the some scenes. Ideas. Hey, if you have something that you want us to mention or bring up, shoot us a message. Many of you have. You know, There's yeah. many things that we don't get to cover that you suggest. Don't think that we don't read those. We do. And yeah. we are interested in what you guys think because it's because of you that we're able to produce this show and really want to continue pressing on. There's many things coming um, in the dental guys. Yeah. Um, and we had such a great time with Dr. Dan German from the episode uh, before this. So if you haven't listened to that, I highly recommend you go back and listen to the brain behind uh, orthodontic, modern orthodontics and listen to that first episode first. And this episode Dan loosened up a little bit as we got to know him a little bit better. And Johnny was telling us about a time that he went to South Africa as a representative of the orthodontic community and gave a lecture. And he was there with Dennis Tarnow. And he mentioned about the time that he had pictures and everything surrounding tables and, and him and Dennis were all hanging out. And his daughter was like, what? Sitting on Dennis's shoulders and yeah, playing and in his hair, playing in his hair. He's like, yeah, he had a bigger afro then. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I yeah, mean, and he's. I mean, it was cool because he said he's like, yeah, I've been going back and listening to a lot of your older episodes, and he said I saw you interview Dennis Tarnow, and he's like, that's one of my heroes, and he said, you know, that was the first time that he'd really met uh, Tarnow in person. Even then, 30, 25, 30 years ago, 
Mm. Uh, Tarnow was already pretty pretty big deal, pretty yeah. famous. And uh, they chose Dr. German to go and present at this conference. And here he was. So <clears throat> the coolest thing, he tells us this story as we're doing around the time we interviewed or after we finished interviewing. The next morning comes into the course for day two of the course, brings us the picture. He dug he him up, man. He through his pictures, found it. There it was, him and Dennis Tarnow. And then showed us some cool pictures of uh, Frank Spear and Dave Matthews and mm-hmm. Vince Kokich, which was basically his mentor. Mm. And uh, and and it was just really cool to connect the dots and to see, you know, really some torches getting passed, you know. And and it's I think so that good. there's a there's a certain interesting similarity that I feel like uh, he has to some of these other educators in terms mm-hmm. of not only being high level but really talking about a balance between. Yeah. What is important in your life with with uh, you know your family, your happiness, but also that that comes from being committed to quality and doing it right and, and sleeping well at the end of the day because you did a good job. This episode though is very different than the first one because the first one we kind of just were letting him tell tell us about him and what he's about mm-hmm. and what he's interested in. This one we wanted to dive in a little bit, Wes. We wanted to really kind of question him on some questions that we have always had for for orthodontists, but we felt mm-hmm. like he could really speak for a lot of the high-level orthodontists. This guy's been using, had been using comb beam technology since like the late 2000s, published mm-hmm. an article in 2010 about it. Um, so he's got a huge history with that, has, has been thinking about airway for a long time. Uh, he's not afraid of controversy because, mm-hmm. you know, here he is helping to empower uh, general dentist to get into orthodontics. Obviously, there's some people that don't love that. And so he talks a little bit about, you know, some of these controversial topics with great, I think he does a great job of He's a great being authority. able to educate yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and stay on the positive. You know, one of the questions we're going to ask it. him later, and I'm not going to ruin the whole thing, but we just asking him, what is his greatest concern about the future of dentistry? And I think you're just going to love his answer to this because it is very insightful and I think it made me think differently about how I feel about the future of dentistry. So, mm-hmm. I mean, Wes, this is a great episode. So hang in just after a quick word from our sponsor and the return of Dr. Dan German. This is Justin Goodbrand. and here is today's tip. Now is the time to review your insurances. Review your home, your auto, your disability, your life, your health, your general liability, your malpractice, your business overhead. If you're working with a planner, they will probably do it on your behalf. If you're not working with a planner, reach out to your insurance agents for help. And this year, make sure you have cybersecurity coverage. For more information about today's topic and other dental-related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. And we're back here today with Dr. Dan German and and you guys know him from the show uh, where we talked a little bit about our training and what ortho brain's about, how he got ortho brain started. And, you know, we're going to get into some high level stuff here about some things that we mentioned last time. But, Dan, you know somebody that's one of our favorite clinicians that we quote in, you know, in yeah, we all, had on the show. Yeah, we've had him on the show. One of our highlights of our show. Yeah, Dennis Tarnow is one of the leading periodontists. Yeah. Um, in the world, Leading th- one of the thought leaders yeah. in implants yeah, and of all time, one of our favorite persons to interview of all time. And if you hadn't heard that show, go back and listen to it because it's a great one. Um, but you know Dennis Tarnow, and you had a special you go way set. back. Yeah, you guys go way. So tell us your Dennis Tarnow. Back. Tell us your Dennis Tarnow story. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear your Dennis Tarnow yeah. story. <laughs> okay, so we go back to the mid '90s. Yeah, and I get this invitation to speak at the African Dental Association in South that's Africa. That's even a thing, right? I love that. That's that a thing. was the most incredible invitation that I ever had. The most generous association of dentists. That must have been on the planet. You're in your 30s. I'm in my 30s. I'm a pretty young guy. Yeah. And they selected 
a periodontist, a prostodontist, an orthodontist. They wanted to represent each of the specialties, so they had a keynote speaker representing each specialty from okay. around the world. Uh, Dennis and I were two guys from the U.S. So they chose you to be the orthodontist. Who, who chose you? The, the, the Dental the Society? Society? Yeah, they, that must have been the Orthodontic Association, the Dental Society. Yeah. Think about at that time in my life, I'm in my mid-30s, I've got kids, I'm seeing about 156 patients a day. <laughs> six, Is that all? <laughs> six days, I'm working five days a week, sometimes a sixth day before I started to observe the Sabbath, and I'm giving lectures about once a month or every six weeks, I'm on the road giving a what? lecture. And you're still married? <laughs> and I've got um, all kinds of personal things that I'm attentive to with sports and that, and I get this invitation, I don't really have time to think too much about the gravity of it until I see who the speakers are. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm so excited to go to South Africa. So I take two of my kids with me to South Africa. Awesome. And we get over there, and it was the most impressive, phenomenal welcome. Um, they fly the keynote speakers to South Africa. They pick us up at the airport, and they take us directly to a safari in Kruger National Park region. Wow. wow. So they entertained the keynote speakers for a full week. They took us from northern South Africa all the way down That's to Cape Town. Five-star wow. accommodations all the way. They knew how to take care of it. They paid for everything. It was unbelievable. Wow. And I come to find out that I'm with Dennis Tarno. <laughs> Dennis Tarno, the rock star of rock stars. I mean, my hero. And I'm I'm on not only the stage, you know, the same venue as him, but I'm going to be vacationing with him for wow. a week before mm. we go the speaking gig. And I've mm -hmm. got my young kids, and he has some kids. Yeah. He has a, I think he had a son. So we're there, and my daughter, who is now a dentist, Laura German, <laughs> oh, wait, was a little she's kid. She's listening to this right, right. now. She's right? a little kid. <laughs> Let's see, if this was 96, then she was six years old. She okay. was born in 1990. See, Laura, even though I have seven of them, I remember that you were born <laughs> in 1990. That's good. And I have a photograph of my Laura while we're at a safari climbing on Dennis Tarno's head. And <laughs> that man has a fine helmet of hair. He does. And imagine, does. if you see him now, imagine what it was like in the mid-90s. I bet it was unkempt a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. A little bit bigger. He is a true hero at so many levels, <laughs> even in the hair department. He's your hair oh, hero. What a great guy. So, oh, that is awesome. So, you know, I didn't know if he remembered the experience, but uh, he, he was a keynote speaker at the Ohio Dental Association about 10 years ago. And when I saw him on the circuit, I went and found this photo from our Africa pictures. And mm. I said, do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and uh, had, had some good laughs. You also awesome. told me um, that it, you've been trying to catch up to some of our shows so that you can kind of get to know us a little bit better. And you said you've learned some things about emulsification. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm just so sorry right. that you listen to that. I mean, it, I mean, you if you listen to that, you know, Wes is telling me this stuff about emulsification. And I mean, it was just, I mean, we're both just super nerds. and But, but you got to hear that discussion. So right. it was classic. <laughs> and it really was the first time in many years that I was able to integrate my knowledge of organic chemistry. Yes. <laughs> right. It and bring it right into dentistry. just occasionally <laughs> does get used, doesn't right. it? Right. They told us we would never use it again. There we go. We used it. We used it. Just once. We but, used it. Oh, right. man. I'm glad well, you've enjoyed listening it, to uh, us. It, <laughs> occasionally we, we get we get on some good topics. Wes is bees. I mean, he's got just, it's, it's always fun. Never a dull moment. So last time when we were talking, when we had John, we talked about the, the company, we talked about OrthoBrain, we talked about really more, more importantly, I mean, that, that's just one part of it. We talked about why GPs should consider orthodontics and what that does for their practice, what that does for really the community, what that does for the world, and why OrthoBrain is, is excited about what's happening with that. And I think that was awesome. So go back and listen to that show if you haven't to kind of know who Dan is a little bit more. But I, I really am interested in, in hearing some of your thoughts because when we first got to meet you at the American Academy Fixed Prosthodontics meeting, we were just kind of asking you some, some things that have been on our mind as, as somebody who we know has been involved in orthodontic education for a long time. Um, and one of the things that our listeners know we've been interested in for, for the last couple of years, especially after we, are, we got kind of our minds blown about 
airway and how technology is changing our understanding of what's important with airway and yeah, how that relates to the, the shape of the jaw and the, and the size of the jaw and where teeth are and where the tongue is. And it, it really brought us back to the question that we've, we've kind of wrestled with a little bit is where does orthodontics fit in, in this world of, of airway? Um, and maybe one of the first questions that I would maybe want to just hear your, your thoughts on is, Cone Beam CT has been out a long time. I mean, you, you were talking about in 2010, you wrote a paper about uh, how uh, people could assess using CBCT uh, orthodontic situations. And, and so you've been obviously involved in that technology a long time. But there's still a lot of orthodontists that don't even have a CBCT. Uh, and and I, that's changing. But I wonder why is that? And, and is, how useful is Cone Beam CT in orthodontics? Should more orthodontists be embracing that? And, and maybe why haven't they done that as much? It's real difficult for me to give good justification as to why an orthodontist would not use Cone Beam technology. All right. It's clear. The evidence is clear that you are able to see much more if you're reviewing a cone beam than if you're reviewing a 2D image. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. Uh, a friend of mine named James Ma has published some great articles. He's a terrific speaker about cone beam and how it relates to orthodontic diagnosis. And the bottom line is that you can only see about two thirds of the data that in a 2D x-ray mm -hmm. as is available in a cone beam. And so I have a strong opinion about that, and I really feel that, that you're compromising your ability to make a diagnosis in orthodontics for the complex treatments mm. and maybe even for the routine treatments. Do you think it's more important than Ceph? I would say that given the choice between a lateral Ceph and a comb beam, even if the comb beam is a little bit limited in the field of view, mm -hmm. because of course you can make a Ceph if you have a full field of view. Field right. of view means right. how much of the head you can see. If you can see the entire head, well then you have a Ceph plus much more. So right. say you had a nine by nine, which yeah. is basically more limited, like more limited, just showing the jaws. I think those images are fantastic mm -hmm. because they show me how the teeth are positioned within the jaws. And I can't see that in a 2D Ceph. Mm. A 2D Ceph will give me some, some good information about the angulation of the teeth. Mm -hmm. and the relative size of the jaws, but they're always referenced to something else. They're referenced to um, a plane between the eyes and the ears or to your nose. However, with a comb beam, when, once you go 3D, you can see how the teeth are positioned within the jaws, and you know what the bony boundaries are for teeth movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of people call that the bone trough. Exactly. And the bone trough can be violated, and it is violated quite often in orthodontics. So one of the most astounding, shocking things was acquiring a comb beam and making progress 3D panos on my ortho patients and seeing how frequently we violated the bony no, wait a boundary. Minute. Yeah. Okay, this so is, this, this is heavy. the cool part is because this is where it gets heavy. You probably have taken more CTs on patients, maybe. Going back further. Going at least. back yeah. further, at least. And that's why we want to talk to you about this. And so, what you're saying is, is that you're going to tell us some evidence that you've seen doing follow up right. on patients that you've done orthodontics on. Yeah. That's why you're on our so, show. So, how yeah. does what you see on CBCT relate to what you see in the mouth when you talk about violating? The bone trough, okay, yeah. because this is where the rubber meets the road of controversy with this is we've been treating orthodontic in an orthodontic manner that has involved expansion or tipping of teeth for many, many, many years. Um, in some cases, for the for the sake of not extracting teeth or right. whatever the reason that people have to do that, when we do that, sometimes we violate the bone trough. What have you seen in your experience? Does that relate to directly to what you see with, say, recession, mobility? Uh, what do you see? Oh, re relapse? I mean, some of these issues. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because not a lot of people, there's not a lot of published data on this long term. Right. The questions you ask are brilliant. The answers are not readily available. Let me tell you what my <laughs> observations are. I knew you'd say that. Here are the <laughs> observations. You know, what happens if you put your finger on a hot stove? 
You burn. You, take you burn. It off. Yeah. You take it off. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because an alarm goes off. That's bad. It hurts. My skin's going to burn. It might even catch on fire, right? Yeah. Now, what happens when you're doing orthodontics on a patient? You're not, and all of a sudden you push the tooth through the bone. And now instead of having a, a root <clears throat> in the bony trough, it's air cooled because it's outside the bone. Mm. And you saw a picture of that today. Sure, sure. I did that. It doesn't hurt. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily show clinically. And so I've put together comb beam courses where you look at the patient and everything looks just right. The soft tissue looks good. If you take a CEF and you measure the angle of the teeth, it looks good. Everything seems just right. And then here comes the comb beam. You look in 3D and you find out that a tooth is outside of the bone. Yeah. And it was so humbling, so shocking that I really took note of it. And that's what made me really passionate about digging deep into comb beam and figuring out what its role ought to be in orthodontics. And that's the genesis of coming up with that article that identifies which images you want to save to your patient chart from a 3D comb beam, a from yeah. a, whether it's a pano or a fold feel of a, what do you do with all that data? There's an infinite number of pictures that you could make yeah. from a comb beam. Which ones are going to be most useful? But what I hear you saying, yeah. though, is that Go forward, John. there's not necessarily a clinical correlation. In, and I know this is just from purely your anecdotal experience. I right. realize that you're not making a statement about this is the truth. But in your anecdotal experience, did you see a correlation with when you had teeth outside the bone trough? that you were seeing a, a higher incidence of recession and, 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 and mobility, dehiscence, relapse, any of those things? Or did it seem like it just looked bad on the cone beam? <laughs> it's a great, great question. And I would say that there is more than a little bit of it looking really scary on the cone beam, but the patient sort of kind of being okay. Yeah. In other words, I wasn't seeing the profoundly scary um, side effects hmm. of those bad movements that were occurring. Now, let me reframe that and say that this is not a long-term follow-up of it. Right, right. And I had a very similar observation when it came, dare I say, with implants. Mm. All mm -hmm. right? So mm. yeah. I keep, started scanning my patients. Keep going on. And point. I looked at the implants that were placed. Um, we have we have terrific oral surgeons in Dayton, Ohio. These yeah. guys are wonderful. They put in implants without... The, the benefit of a comb beam for years because it hadn't been invented. That's right. Well, when their patients come in and have orthodontics, I make a comb beam. And I'm looking at implants that are perfed, coming right out of the bone, and you would think that thing would fall out or that you'd, you'd, it would come right through the, the soft tissue. And patients tolerated those things much better than I had anticipated. Now, I saw cases where the, the, the surgeon completely missed the bone and the implant falls out. But when they put it in the bone... Even when it perforated, it seemed like they held up better than better I would have than thought. You think. And we may be having some of that go on. The, the other side of that story is, what does the patient look like in five or ten years right. when we've done that? And the example I use is, is related to implants, where implants can look really fine. When you replace <clears throat> seven and ten with an implant, they look really, really, really good right after you put them in. But in seven years, in 10 years, do they have purpleitis? Do the, do the t does the tissue turn pure? Right. purple? Right. Do they have recession? I don't know what the long-term effects are. I know that it's a bad thing and we want to avoid it. And in the patients where I found it, we were able to go back in and dial in some treatment to try and get those roots back in the bone. So when you're taught in orthodontic school, are you taught to, to pay attention to the bone trough and keep teeth in bone? You really... <laughs> Look, it's not fair for me to be critical of the orthodontic education, but if you don't have a comb beam, then how do you appreciate what the trough is? Right. You can talk about it from a theoretical standpoint, but if you can't see it, but then it's really difficult. But do you think currently, cut. though, now that comb beam technology is in every dental school, and maybe, I don't know if you can speak to this or not, I, we're, we're, we're asking questions, I'm not sure if you know the answer to either, because that's not your full-time job as an educator, but now that that is in... Uh, orthodontic residencies. Do you do you know? Is it being taught that that's an important thing to look at with CT, or is that just not really? Is CT only being used, say, to look at an impacted canine and know how to direct it in, or you know, I mean, wh how important is that? Um, I can't speak to exactly what's going on at the university level today. I can tell you what was going on when I was a faculty member, and that 
went through 2016. Even in the schools that had comb beam, they weren't using it routinely on their ortho patients. Interesting. That's one adjective <laughs> I could think of. <laughs> yeah, I Profoundly used a very nice word. And for here me. you are, and you wrote, a, you wrote an article on how to utilize it in, in 2010. 2010. Right, and, right, and I'm teaching at the university, and, I have, and I'm helping the residents diagnosis and treatment plan, and I'd have to say, I don't know. Right. Because I don't have the information. I don't have a comb beam. Go get a comb beam. Well, we've got to fill out paperwork. The patient has to pay extra. We've got to do... Th- Let's, let me ask you this question. We, it sounds like education in 2016, you know, hadn't got there yet. I'm hoping it's moving forward. Right. right? Okay? Would you treat a child um, in the mixed dentition without a comb beam? I chose not to. I chose to use a comb beam for diagnosis and treatment planning okay. and my orthodontic practice. So what about an adolescent? Would you Same. What about an adult? Same. Same. Okay. I think so, and and what would you do? Let me ask let me take that a step further. So if you do comb beam C T examination and you notice that teeth are in thin bone or are close to or out of the bony trough. And you need your treatment plan calls for expansion or proclination or some type of situation where you're concerned about pushing teeth further out through that that thin or absent bone trough. Knowing what you know, and again, this is anecdotal, but how would you proceed? Would you consider doing uh, pre grafting of soft tissue or bone? I mean, some people. Uh, advocate, you know, with surgically facilitated ortho doing, you know, massive bone grafting and soft tissue grafting, and then maybe combining that with traumatizing bone to get faster. Yeah, corticotomies. But how, how, Mm -hmm. I mean, would you, would you say, because you didn't see a lot of necessarily clinical correlation between being out of the bone trough and problems, would you stay, kind of just say, well, we're just gonna we're gonna move the way we we've always we're gonna finish moved, a, we're gonna finish change? in a class two situation. Yeah, or would you we can't that? close this because we can't close this anterior open bite, or we can't get coupling here because yeah. Does it does it change the way you would approach the cases mm-hmm. with that information? Yes, it does. Um, now, if you're talking about a child, if you're talking about a mixed dentition mm-hmm. child or even uh, <clears throat> an adolescent, then. Regardless of the tissue, if they need their upper jaw expanded, you ought to be able to expand their upper jaw. In other words, if you do, if you do expansion of the palate and the, and the two sides of the upper jaw separate and they expand, they ought to be fine. And, right. and those tend to work out really well. Yeah. Um, where you have limitations is when you have that, that, that really narrow bony trough and you have a lot of crowding of the teeth, and you're trying to think, is this extraction or non-extraction? Yeah. If they don't have a whole lot of bone to work with, then you might need to take a tooth out or some teeth out or do interproximal reduction where you're not pushing the teeth too far forward. The fact that on the limited number of patients I saw that didn't have obvious side effects from pushing the teeth through the bone, to me, doesn't change the outlook I have for a child going into orthodontics. I want to keep the teeth and bone for every person, regardless of their age. We know that that's better, and we don't have any absolute um, answers as to what the long-term effects are of violating that. So for children and mixed dentition, you can go ahead and use maxillary expansion. Yeah. When you're talking about expanding um, in the AP direction, when you're moving the teeth forward, I'd be very, very cautious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in adults... You know, are you suggesting that if we reach a point in our treatment planning or even during treatment where, you know, to finish the case appropriately to, one, maybe the patient's expectations are here and we can't achieve those expectations because of the bone trough. And your concern is that if we move it any further to achieve your expectations, you know, we're going to have compromise. Do you feel like that we are at, in 2019, a place where we could suggest, you know, uh, protocols like Wilkodonics um, uh, to remedy... Or more orthognathic surgery. Or more orthognathic surgery. I mean, do we need to be having those discussions more now given what we know from CBCT? I mean, and again, that, we're just talking anecdotally. Yeah. I mean, we're just wondering what you would do maybe in your family or your, you know... A, if you, if you could do it 
the, the way that you would you would love to do it every single time. You know, is that is that where we're headed? Do you think toward more of those discussions? Yeah, I'm I'm going to throw in because you are you are orthodentists. You're doing orthodontics <laughs> as dentists, so you are orthodentists. So let's get you tuned into the to the nomenclature. When you have somebody who has let's call it a skeletal dysplasia, the top and the bottom jaws don't match yeah. in any dimension, length, width. If they don't match then you have options in a child. You can use growth appliances to help stimulate additional growth, and you can move the jaws. The heads are made of, of rubber. They're really squishy in kids. Adults have heads made of concrete. You're not going to move the jaws very well. So if you're going to try and correct the malocclusion and there's a skeletal dysplasia, the jaws don't match, your options are to have a surgical procedure of some sort. It could be orthodontic surgery or what orthodontists call camouflage. Mm. Camouflage means that you hide the skeletal dysplasia. You hide that by tilting the teeth one way or another. So if it's a class two, instead of finishing with the upper incisors at angle, ideal angle to the upper jaw, they tilt back a little bit, and that decreases the overjet, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing you could do is you could do additional interproximal reduction on the upper teeth mm -hmm. to retract them. Sure. And so, yes, you've created a bolt and two size discrepancy, but it's in your favor of correcting the problem. That's camouflage. Mm -hmm. There's a limit as to how far you can camouflage, and that 3D image is going to determine what the boundaries are of that camouflage treatment. Mm -hmm. How far can I bring the upper teeth back before I push the roots through bone? And we're not going to push them through bone despite the fact that I didn't always see a side effect mm -hmm. from doing that. Yeah. So one thing that we have found as we move from this discussion regarding just skeletal, you know, skeletal dysplasia, we have, you know, a, you know, a small premaxilla and a, you know, a strong lower jaw or whatever it might be, whether it's a small upper palate, whatever that might be, you know, and that we're trying to correct that as we move into this world in orthodontics of medicine. Okay, mm -hmm. because the medicine now has started to just really lean hard on dentists. Even the American Dental Association is having meetings about medical <clears throat> things that we need to be looking at. And the main one we hear keep hearing come up time after time is airway and that our treatment decisions as we are orthodentist and orthodontist. Right are starting to be impacted, right? These decisions where you talk about, well, it's IPR and kind of retract or let's, you know, and then you have to have a conversation with a patient that is medically compromised, right, already, or could be medically compromised in the future, right? Which we don't know, right? But we want to try to set that patient up for Success for health, yeah, and health, long term, right, right? right? Not just retention of yeah. the case. Yeah. So now this question comes up of how much does orthodontics contribute to airway problems? And we, I think we know, um, well, and talk about that in the adolescent and the child, maybe versus adults, and and kind of tell us what what do we know, what do we not know? Because this is another area where we hear so many different opinions. You know, some people saying. Well, there's no effect. Uh, you know, we're we're just we're throwing orthodontists under the bus, or you know that orthodontists are hurting people by taking out uh, four by cuspids, right? And so you have both sides of this argument kind of coming against each other. Where, what what do you think we know, and what do we don't? What do we not know about this? You put so much into that box to unpack. <laughs> I'm going to forget half of the questions you just <laughs> That's asked. Okay. That's How okay. How about we start with this? Let's start with this concept. When I'm planning an orthodontic treatment, I like to see the end right at the beginning. I want to know exactly what the address is. Where am I going? What am I trying to create here for my dentist that's going to do prosto, restorative? How do I set this patient up for success so that they're going to have a healthy, um, a healthy occlusion and, and perio and, and the rest of it? Now, take that same sort of thinking of seeing what you're trying to create in the end. So if you have a child and the child's in the mixed dentition, I think the mistake is to look at that person as st a static image of that person in the mixed dentition because guess what? They're going to get older mm -hmm. and they're going to become adolescents. And the fact 
that their airway is okay now because it's below the threshold of them being symptomatic doesn't mean that they're not really close to being symptomatic. They're okay right. now. Right. But when they become adolescents, hopefully they're still okay because we know the lymphoid <clears throat> tissue shrinks when they hit puberty. Right. But then something happens after marriage. Right. McDonald's. Right. Exactly. And so <laughs> Taco Bell. Right. It's called about a pound a year. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you have a pound a year of body mass, and your neck starts to get bigger, and all of a sudden, what was an acceptable airway in your youth may not be a good, healthy airway as an adult. So if you're looking at it as a child, fast forward and imagine what the consequences could be of your treatment for when they're mature adults. Right. And when they have medications that make them more vulnerable to apnea, or when they have more more mass in their necks and in their bodies. And when they lose muscle tone because of age, maybe they have a glass of wine at night and they have an impact. So some of it is self-induced, but nevertheless, I'm always trying to figure out what we can do that's going to set somebody up for a healthy life long-term. So airway-centric orthodontics as a child and an adolescent. I think it should be in front of mind when you're diagnosing and treatment planning. So that's regardless, it that's, doesn't matter what the age is of that's the That's more medicine in your practice than we in 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 dental practice than really we've ever incorporated. From an airway standpoint. From an airway yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Right. That's yes. becoming more important. Yes. And orthodontics, it's funny that it's come full circle. I'm going to share something with you. Maybe it's a little bit tangential. But orthodontics, as I told you, is the second oldest specialty in all of medicine and dentistry. Mm. And the original orthodontists, they look a lot like me. I mean, they dress like this. They had the starched white shirts and bow ties. and and But they had an arrogance about them. And orthodontists to this day, I'm sorry, uh, colleagues, but we have an arrogance about no. us. All right? no. and, and so they felt that orthodontics was more a discipline of medicine than dentistry. And they really wanted to be a part of a medical specialty. Interesting. Because of all the growth and development. Growth and development. That's and, kind of what I thought. And, I thought right. that too. That's and, supposed to yeah. be their specialty, right? Yeah. That's it. And now all of a sudden, <clears throat> you go 100 years, uh, more than 100 years, and all of a sudden, orthodontics has a real medical impact. Big mm -hmm. time. Yeah, because I mean, but but there's still a lot of people going, la, 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 I'm closing my ears. I'm just, all I do, I'm just a tooth mechanic. I'm just moving right. teeth around. And, and, and is that, is that really, but, but do they have a case for saying that? I mean, is what we're doing, say, let, let's move out of the, I think we all know and agree in children and adolescents that we can have a real impact long term. I think that that's, I think no one would disagree with that. But what, what about adults and what about the decisions that we make maybe in the, maybe in the adolescent stage as well, as far as. Um, how much does orthodontics affect the, the, the true long term? Do we know that? Can we say that orthodontists are doing harm by uh, taking teeth out and constricting a tongue space and that type of thing? Or is this something that we're, we're maybe just thinking that way empirically, but we don't really have data to support that? It's an excellent question. I think it's going to be a long time before anybody can give you a great answer to that. In other words... I don't think we have the data to support a real powerful argument one way or the other. Yeah. My thought is be receptive and listen to everybody mm -hmm. and be respectful of the different opinions because there's typically a particle of truth in, in both of the different positions. Yeah. And I don't think there's room for people to be militant about it because we don't have the scientific evidence for that. And the reason I'm saying that, I'm not here because I want to defend the orthodontist. If you're looking at a child or an adult, person of any age, and their teeth are so crowded that in order to straighten them, you're going to have to push the teeth out of the bony trough, which is what we spoke about 15 minutes ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, taking teeth out might end up leaving the teeth right where they are. In other words, <coughs> the whole tongue space may not be altered in anyway right. by taking the teeth out when the extractions are indicated. Now, having said that, we also talked about camouflage treatment. Yep. So if you take out teeth and you do pull them back, well, then you might have an impact. In other words, extracting teeth when maybe you shouldn't extract teeth. So maybe in that case, instead of doing the camouflage 
for a big class two and retracting the upper teeth, maybe offering a surgical alternative mm -hmm. where you bring the lower jaw forward. We call it BSSO, mm -hmm. bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. That just means a, a moving the jaw forward. That that is really um, an airway um, respectful and friendly way to treat a patient. What percentage of patients are in that situation, would you think? I think for children, we're probably, we're probably talking about 10% of the kids having some form of, of airway issue. Yeah. And you, you, you probably, you speak to so many people, your knowledge base is unbelievable. So you would, you would have better data than me, but I'm thinking that we're at about 10% of our kids have an issue. And so it's been underdiagnosed, under, under treated, under respected. We don't always know how to fix it, but at least we're getting to the step where we can start to diagnose it. Man. I think that, that that's a, a, an area that I think both sides of this argument have some validity. You know, I think that there's a, a legitimate concern that we're maybe overblowing the idea that uh, because we took some teeth out that we're hurting people, and we don't really know if that's true. Uh, there's still a lot of argument about, I mean, there's people who will say all TMJ problems are caused by airway. And, and, you know, then there's people that will say, you know, sp still take the approach of, you know, it's multifactorial. There's a lot more going on than just that. But it seems like right now we're in this this huge flux of, of this understanding. And, uh, and everybody, of course, especially if they're lecturing or if they're selling something or if they've got some skin in the game with that, they, they want to they want to create some disruption because they want to get that out there. And so I think that this this whole evidence base that we want to have is it's just evolving. I mean, we we saw somebody talk just gosh last year who's you know pretty much just said look literally, literally every problem we have essentially in dentistry is caused by airway, you know every everything, and uh, including almost all TMJ problems. And they won't even make an occlusal splint for a patient without a home sleep test, you know. So that's bold. Uh, and then you've got other people who are. Uh, you know, not even sleep testing people at all and making them snoring appliances. American know, Academy no of uh, Prostodontist uh, or American College of Prostodontist came out in 2017 and said that 50% of patients with flat plane cuspid rise splints, um, actually those splints make their airway worse in 50% right. of patients. So it's messing with us, right? So now. It's, I, it's messing with us. It, it, I feel like that, you know, when we, mm -hmm. we have an airway study club and we have some very smart people in there, ear, nose, and throat, sleep technicians, sleep physicians, those, those people, and they know that children are having issues. Mm -hmm. And they even say, like I'll never forget what our adult ENT said, that it's a sleep related breathing disorders are epidemic mm -hmm. epidemic proportions and if i think what you said in the beginning here is that when we started talking about diagnosing with cone beam and looking at things is that you have an airway frontal like approach mm -hmm. to things right. because why not well i want to because ask if you're wrong what does it hurt right right, right. right. it's a good thing I want, to, I want to ask a question that is somewhat related to this, but it, it, it has to do with views on, we've kind of touched a little bit on orthognathic surgery. Mm. Is the reason that we're doing less orthognathic surgery now today in your view because of better orthodontics or is it because of less reimbursement for surgery? <laughs> orthognathic surgery was overdone. Okay. I will tell you, and I was leading the charge. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, we did about 50 jaw surgeries in my orthodontic practice a year. Hmm. About 50 a year. That's a lot. It's a lot. And it was, it was such a cop-out. Because hmm. if we had any skeletal dysplasia, say, well, we'll put the braces on. You go see the oral surgeon. And in nine months, we'll do the operation. Nine months later, we'll take the braces off. And everything's corrected. Yeah. That we forgot that we have the ability to correct some of these, these complicated malocclusions by being, um, being willing to roll up our sleeves. And, and with the advent of temporary anchorage devices, we were able to, to, to get more It's kind of what movements. I wondered if you would talk about that a little bit compared to surgeries. That, is that, that changed things in a, in a way, do you think, as far as what we could treat without surgery? Do you think that Absolutely. was a major thing? 
it was a major thing, and it was overdone too. <laughs> and pictures when we, when we first when we first became hip to uh, temporary anchorage devices, it looked like my patients got shot in the mouth, you know, with a, right. a shotgun of tads. <laughs> right. right. You put in ten tads. Right. So we overused things when we caught on. Yeah. And we did that with orthognathic surgery. We did too much. The pendulum swings. It goes in the opposite direction, and we don't do it enough sometimes. Mm. The reimbursement is a big issue. We've got to find a way to make it affordable for people to do it because it is one of the universal solutions to obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. Jaw surgery is one of the universal Talk about that. successful ways to do it. Talk about the, the, the success you've seen in your practice. Well, I'll, I'll talk about what I saw published as well as what I saw yeah. in the practice. Yeah. And that is that if you have somebody and they're diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, it's not for every form of apnea. If it's neurogenic, it's not going to help. Sure. Right. We're talking about central apnea is there neurogenic. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So think about the patient where you can advance the jaws the lower jaw 10 millimeters. Mm. If you can advance a lower jaw 10 millimeters, you're going to solve their apnea, their obstructive sleep apnea, almost universally. Mm. You've got to get the 10 millimeters. If it's less than 10 millimeters, then you, you your success rate is going to go down. Mm -hmm. And so the hesitation with that was, what are you going to do to their faces? Mm. You're yes. going to make people look like gorillas? Sure. And it's amazing. In the same way that the body was able to adapt to... to pushing teeth through roots sometimes, mm -hmm. that the body seemed to adapt to that. So we'd have people that only had a, a mild um, overjet, so you couldn't advance the mandible 10 millimeters without making them class three, so you had to advance the upper jaw. You advance the jaws 10 millimeters with the bimaxillary advancements, mm -hmm. and the apnea is resolved. Yeah. It's wow. really phenomenal, and it, and it would happen almost immediately. So we're seeing medical insurance start to put clauses in their medical policy that if a patient fails CPAP, right, that uh, orthognathic surgery. Yeah, we've got a patient right now in my practice that's uh, we're working up towards surgery who the surgery is being 100% paid for because of you know having severe apnea and and could not tolerate CPAP. So uh, it's starting to change, right. but I think that the, now the major limitation seems to be. Just a fear, well, part of it is just a lack of understanding of just still needing to educate people across the board. But then there's there's a fear of when you use the word surgery that um, you're going to lose business to somebody else. Because if you say surgery, that's a scary word. And and I think that they're, um, you, you're right to maybe say it was overused, but I, I don't know. I wonder if it's maybe being underused today. It is underused today. Um because of the consequences of of having a, an airway that's untreated or setting somebody up for failure when they mature and you when they get older and when they get bigger yeah and start to medicate now they're not tolerating the airway that you that you gave them through your through your camouflage treatment when in fact they would have been mm -hmm. better served by having an advancement right and you were going to say too that patients that you thought they would look you know, really forward and ape-like, you know, per se. Right. They actually, you, they perceived that they looked nice. Right. right. They, they were there fine There were studies, that. actually, that they showed that, right? That. Yeah. That they were fine with that. Yes. And no one perceived that they looked odd or, you know, having no. that large of an advancement no. done. And, and, in fact, the health, you know, of their body now. Right. I think I've seen it was something yeah. like 93% success, uh, like you say, resolving. Resolving, not just you know, improving, but resolving severe OSA with by max advancement. That's pretty tremendous. Who, who, who yeah. do you feel like is leading the forefront right now? If you could go listen to someone speak um, about this particular type of dentistry, orthodentistry, and as far as by maxillary advancement, TAD expansion, in the most highest of levels, of how it should be done. Who's speaking to that today? Who could our listeners go hear? Who could John and I go listen to? Well, I would say from a surgery standpoint, I heard the Arnett Gunson. Mm -hmm. Mike Gunson. Yeah. He yeah. works with Spear. He's and, working with Spear Yeah, now. he's now involved right. with Spear Education. Yeah. And so I, I felt that they had a really good program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I haven't... Uh, I haven't had an occasion to hear all the different speakers out there. Sure. You may have heard um, Dr. Evans, Mariana Evans, mm -hmm. while you were out in Chicago. Didn't hear it. No. I uh. was at the Equilibration Society and the and the Pross meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And she spoke at one of those. Mm. And what she's doing is um, she's expanding adult jaws, all right, which you're not supposed to be able to do. Yeah. But she's doing it. And the way she's doing it is with a more limited surgery than traditional orthognathic surgery. Now, I'm not talking about solving the apnea by advancing the jaws. But she's, she's making her person a nasal breather is what she's helping. She's trying to make, she's increasing the size of the airway. Yes. And the way she's doing it is by placing uh, screws, tads, in the palate and making expanders that push on those screws to help mm -hmm. widen jaws mm -hmm. in mature patients, in adults. And I saw the imagery that she provided, and I felt that she did a really nice job showing an alternate way to do it, an alternate way from the full-blown orthognathic surgery. Mm. So it caught my attention. Well, she's somebody to maybe look to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it caught my attention. I'll, I'm gonna, sh in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, give her a shout out tomorrow in in the course. I, I cool. took a picture of one of her slides, and it has her name on it, so it's it's not plagiarizing. Mm -hmm. right, but right. I wanted to, I just wanted to put it out there. Um, uh, that I'd like to learn more about about some of the work that she's doing and and what the benefits are. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you totally different topic before we kind of close out because I've just been this has been something that's been interesting to me. Um, tell us a little bit about your views on the difference in bracket design because there's as a general dentist again just I learning to, a little bit more that during the class. Today. Yeah, just <laughs> learning a little bit more about this and you know you've got you've got to, and I don't I, I don't know I we try not to mention a ton of brand names, but there's different brands of brackets out yes. there, right? Yes. And there's, there's, there's disciples, it seems like, <laughs> of some of these different <laughs> brands and, and approaches. And uh, based on your experience, I know I feel like you, you, you can speak to this very well. How much of a difference is there in treatment outcomes or ease of treatment between different bracket systems? Or is it really, in the end, it's, it's what you're most comfortable with? This is why yeah. I didn't ask it during this, the class today. Yeah, <laughs> I have a really strong opinion on that, and it happens to be backed up by the literature. Okay, all right, bring Let's it, hear. bring it. So, what's being sold is that you have self ligating brackets, and with the self ligating brackets, there's some magic within those brackets that allows you to do things that you can't do with other brackets. Yes, as if the teeth know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> the teeth really, all they feel are moments and forces and couples. Moments and couples, the four systems, they feel the pressure, whether it's applied by plastic, a metal bracket, a ceramic bracket, a self ligating bracket, a triangular bracket, a vertically slotted bracket, a beg bracket, an edgewise bracket, a ribbon wise bracket. All they feel are the forces that are delivered by the wire via the bracket. The bracket is just a handle on the tooth so that the wire can affect pressure. And so there are some really good marketers and salespeople passing out Kool-Aid, saying that the, it, it, the, the pain level is lower, the teeth straighten faster, all these wonderful things happen. Who knows? Maybe it even improves airway. I'm not sure. I'm not <laughs> teasing or making fun, but I've heard some of the claims that are really outside there. The stuff gets researched, and the research does not support that. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't anecdotal um, sure. documentation of, sure. the, of the cases they're doing. Um, we had... Great editorial about cheerleaders, and those are those are paid advocates. I was a paid advocate for 3M for a, a variety of different companies. I never sold their brackets, but I was paid by them. Yeah. And so personalities like me who get really excited about things, we can sell. Sure. <laughs> and I didn't sell the brackets. I just I knew what was going on in the industry, and I knew factually that some of the speakers at the big meetings were getting paid by the bracket they sold. Yeah. And that's disturbing. And and so um, it so is. So the teeth it is really don't disturbing. know that they have a brand name bracket. How would I mean, they, how, how I mean, would they know? That? Surely they know. <laughs> it's like that's... putting like a Porsche emblem on the back of your car. Doesn't that make it faster? Dude, I got a V eight attached to that number eight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because <laughs> that seems to be what we hear as we yeah. hear. You know, well, this is the thing. This makes all the difference. Here's how it works. The bracket is a handle on the tooth. The wire will straighten the bracket not the tooth. Mm. If you put the braces on straight and you put a wire in, you're going to have straight teeth. Mm. They might not be perfect, but they're going to be pretty straight. Right. And then you can fine tune things if you need to bend the wire a little bit. But if the bracket is on straight, the wire will make the teeth straight. Awesome. And so when choosing a bracket to use for orthobrain, I'm looking for something that's comfortable for patients, mm -hmm. that's easy for doctors and technicians to work with, that's effective, that's been used for decades, and 
nothing has been proven to work any better. Mm-hmm. And, and some of these other brackets are significantly more expensive too, right? I exactly. mean, coming along with some of these brands is a is a huge difference in cost. Is that true? I don't know it much is. about that, but I would think there would be. It's a huge difference in cost. Huh. And so you're not really getting a lot for your money with some of these things. I tried. All right. Because be, 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 if you think back, we didn't have the yeah. evidence. So when new things come out, you don't have any research. Yeah. So I remember talking to one of the really famous uh, orthodontists, and I was at the Hinman meeting, and he was speaking to a group of orthodontists and general practitioners, and he says, we have these new self-lighting brackets. They're so good that I have stripped all of the traditional braces off my patients to put these on to finish them. Wow. 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 That's, That's a, a big statement. statement. <laughs> I go up to him afterwards, and I don't <laughs> want to use his name. He's, he's, he's physically passed. And he was a, he's a giant in orthodontics. He just happened to be selling braces. Like, you, you really stripped your cases because they're that much better? Look me in the eye and tell me I should use those brackets because they're that much better. And being young and impressionable, um, I did what he said. I didn't strip any cases, but I had, at the time, I had four locations. And so we were able to use one bracket system Mm. Very cool. Mm-hmm. In the office. And we did the same thing with other technologies. We did you know, comparing 2D x-rays with 3D x-rays because yeah. we had different systems in mm-hmm. different offices mm-hmm. to compare costs and efficiencies and all this. And we found that we straightened the teeth better with the traditional brackets than we did with the self really? ligating. That when it came to getting lower incisors straight, we felt that you did a better job with a traditional twin bracket. So you had the opposite bracket. approach than what was advocated, the, the complete opposite right. result. Right. And, and, and again, significantly less cost as well. Right. I mean, which is interesting. This is, this is interesting well, to see, me. see, it's rare. This is the reason why it's been so fun having you on yeah. the show is because, you know, we've been asking you a lot of questions that don't have necessarily a, a definitive research-based answer. Based right? answer but, yeah. but your experience and your years... Um, bring a lot to that because I, because of some of these things that you have been doing for so long. And, but this, this question sounds like is definitive and, right. and there is evidence. And so I love to kind of hear that because it helps me to understand how to cut through the marketing. And I think for our listeners, how to, when you're choosing a specialist, for instance, you know, you want to be able to see, well, what's marketing and, and what's really evidence-based. And this helps us even to select our own specialists and maybe think about, well, what can we promise our patients too? What kind of results are they going to get? Two final questions as we kind of move forward into uh, the end of our show here. One, I want to know, what is your biggest concern um, about the future for dentistry? Okay. Just as a whole. All right. Number two, I want, um, we'll answer that question first. The biggest concern I have about dentistry. Wow. You know, I have really crazy glasses. I just see so much good Hmm. that I really am struggling to find the bad. Hmm. I mean, there's a downside to what's happening in dentistry. And we know that the, that there are changes that are occurring. Um, a lot of the changes also bring opportunity. And I see a lot more positive than I see negative. I know it's a different perspective on things. The good old days are right now. Mm. These are the golden years. I mean, imagine everything that all the young practitioners have to look forward to. Mm. Your diagnostic capabilities are so far superior to what we had in, in early in the career. Your ability to do precise work with intraoral scans and, and all that goes with it in printing things in offices, where it's headed, it's, I'm just, I'm envious. I wish that I had another, you know, 35 years to be doing what I'm doing because I want to see printed brackets mm. and, yeah. and I want to see yeah. all the different things that are going to come into dentistry. I think dentistry is going to be um, a fantastic profession for many, many, many Well, that's kind of like what go. I was going to ask you for the second question. Uh, I wanted to save the best for last is what is you feel like is going to be the biggest innovation in dentistry um, in the next, say, 20 years? Is it a product? Is it a diagnostic? Is What is it? Or wow. is it just a, a way of doing things? Because you're an innovator. You think ahead. Mm-hmm. You've always thought ahead. And um, if you were going to say, this is, this, is, this is what I'm really keeping my eye on. Here's what it is. This is going to catch you off guard because it's not a thing. Mm-hmm. It's a process. 
Mm. This is what's forefront in my mind. I've never really um, tried to, to, to answer that question in a, in a formal setting like this. Here's where I think that dentistry can take a quantum leap right now, and that is with our educational system. Mm. Mm. And I'm grateful for all the opportunity that I had from my dental school. I donate. I, you know, I've given them money, and I'm supportive. I feel that we have so much opportunity for increasing the educational experience for, for our dental students that they ought to be able to assimilate all of the technology and the innovation that's out there. You know, imagine how much you know now compared to what you knew when you got to, think of what you know now compared to what a dentist ha mm. has for a knowledge base and level of scholarship when they got out of dental right. school. In other words, what can you do in 8,000 hours of formal education over four years? Mm. What can you put into somebody's mind? And I think we're missing an opportunity there. And I feel that that's what's holding us back is that it's too long to the on-ramp for young people to get on board and fully up to speed in their knowledge base, that those people who, who have the ability to solve a lot of these problems, it takes too long to get there, mm. and it's so much work, and you have to pay for all these commercial courses. Think of all that you've yeah. done in order to, to elevate that, this ability for information exchange. And um, if you read a book, uh, it's called this, have you ever heard of the singularity? The singularity is where you're talking about this merging of the mind mm. with machines. Mm -hmm. It's not, this is not, this is not um, the Jetsons where you're, you're making stuff up. This is where the machines are able to start to take the, the way that our brain makes decisions and the knowledge in our brains and put it together and is able to do a better job than we can do. Mm. Sounds scary. I'll give you an example of where it's in play now. Elon Re Musk recently just posted something Did about you? that. Go ahead. Look at the radiology. Yes, um, yes, yeah. that world. So you know that a computer can read an image better than a doctor can. Right. Pattern it, it recognition. It takes away. A fascinating book, um, The Righteous Mind, it's another fascinating read. How we make decisions and why we screw up our medical diagnosis and treatment planning. Heuristic reasoning. Heuristic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And the article was in the orthodontic literature was written by Preston Hicks, one of the best articles I have ever read in the orthodontic literature. Really didn't talk about moving teeth. It talked about the way we come up with a diagnosis and a treatment plan that our brains remember what we've seen in the past. And as soon as we see somebody as an orthodontist, I know I'm looking at that face. That face needs 5 and 12 extracted and a little bit of IPR on the lower. And there's my treatment plan. Then we make the diagnostic records. And everything that we see in the diagnostic records then supports the treatment that we've already decided upon. Mm. We do Doctors do it backwards. It's not just orthodontists. It's all doctors are vulnerable to that. And I think that we're going to be able to find a way to take that crazy heuristic reasoning and, and poor decision making and avoid a lot of the medical mistakes. The things that we're learning now, which you referenced in either this episode or the previous episode, are is the value of systems and checklists, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And taking that another step where machines are able to learn everything that we know to help us make better decisions in our diagnosis and treatment planning so that we can set people up for health for a lifetime. Mm. Um, I, I think that we're going to be able to integrate our brains and machines in a really powerful way to really that's change exciting. The dynamic. It is and exciting. I, and I think to that's me. when you. I mean, when I, you, my mind is racing right yeah. now. Yeah, when you when you think about and you know everybody's got different views on what futurism is all about, but I think that 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 approach and and what if you listen to some of the minds that are the most positive about the future and you people like Neil Ravikant, people that that understand that you know that this is going to add and enrich our lives yep. in a tremendous way by right. by doing things like this by making us better able to um to be creative uh and and let the machines doing do things that are that are that they are good at and let us be the creative uh per, people that we are and engage that side of our mind instead of being stuck in this same heuristic that we just have created by our our inability to we can't to get rid of biases clear, that, yeah, yeah clear yeah, out our biases right. and be able to to think creatively right and and that's what we need more of so that that's very exciting to to Man. hear you say that and that positivity I think is what we need more of and that's why you're that's why I think you've been successful at what you're doing and why when we come to the course you know we 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 hear that 
come across, you know, loud and clear and why you want more people to be involved in what you're doing, because obviously you love what you're doing. Right. And uh, so it's been great to have you on the show. You know, I, I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. If you guys are, are enjoying what we're talking about, I uh, definitely want you to, first of all, go and check out orthobrain.com, learn more about what Dr. Dan Gurman is doing uh, and about him, get connected with them, uh, find out more about what he's up to. Uh, and then if you want to find out more about us, the Dental Guys, of course, you know where to find us, dentalguys.net, and also on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Send us a message. Let, you, let us know what you thought about this show. Uh, let us know what you think about uh, what what our controversial topics are, or even just what you think about the future. That's what we're all about, is trying to bring you some high-quality content. This has definitely been one of those that's been a lot of fun to do. So connect with us. We'll be back to see you soon. For Wes, for Dr. Dan Gurman, and for myself, we are The Dental Guys. <laughs>